Now, we are at the Feast of Tabernacles, and we took a long time last week to explain the statement and contextualize it so you know the, the real power of it in the setting that it happened, that Jesus makes in verse 12. And what a magnificent statement it is just uh, based on what it says, but you also see the magnitude of it as measured by the ferocity of the opposition that he gets to making it, which astonishes us because, I mean, either what Jesus said there is magnificent and true and our hearts are converted and changed and we believe in him and we trust in him, or even if you don't believe it, okay, so you just, you, you move on, right? But by the end of this chapter, by the end of the back and forth that happens at the starting point, which is this statement that he's the light of the world, the people have picked up stones and they're ready to throw the stones at him. Now, so in verse 12, Jesus spoke to them again and said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. And I won't take the time to go over that again, but I strongly encourage you to find last week's Bible study. Uh, I thought that went really well. And uh, apart from that, though, it's, it's, it's not enough to just read that text and try to figure out what is light, what does it mean to follow, and everything else. There's a very specific historic context that that text fits into. So I, that has to do with what's happening at the Feast of Tabernacles. But then what I have to kind of decide to do uh, as someone who has the task of expositing this chapter is how do we approach what follows from, from that particular statement and the Pharisees' first response in verse 13 uh, all the way to the end of the chapter is, is there is a flow of, of confrontation dialogue back and forth that gets quite heated it's 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 tense but if you just blow through it like if you just kind of read through it at the pace that you perceive that it would have happened when it was played out live you you kind of miss i think the profundity and the depth of some of the things that Jesus says in response to the religious leaders protestations. So, so we're going to do two things here tonight, and we won't do this every week, but I want to at least do it once, is I want to read, starting there in verse 12, all the way to the end of the chapter, with no delusions about covering all of that in one night, although I thought about it, but you would have to just really blow through it to do that. So we're going to break it up over a series of weeks into small chunks so we can really spiritually and mentally digest the things that Jesus says because they're, of course, just fantastic for our edification and for our equipping to be able to go and speak the words of Christ to others, right? So, so I'm going to, after that introduction, I'm going to start reading in verse 12 and I'm going to read all the way to the end of the chapter and I want you to really just kind of feel and, and catch the flow of the back and forth but then when we go verse by verse, we're probably really only going to cover up to uh, verse 19 tonight, or really verse 20. We kind of bookended the passage that we're going to cover tonight last week when we talked about verse 12, and then we got the context from verse 20. So the response to what Jesus says in verse 12 is sandwiched in between those two verses. All right, so you ready? So follow along. I'm simply going to read without comment. And then we'll go back and we'll pick, pick apart, as is our custom, unpack uh, the first little section of it. Here we go. So verse 12 again, Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. The Pharisees therefore said to him, you bear witness of yourself. Your witness is not true. 
Jesus answered and said to them, Even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true, for I know where I came from and where I am going. But you do not know where I come from and where I am going. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one, and yet if I do judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone, but I am with the Father who sent me. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one who bears witness of myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness of me. Then they said to him, Where is your father? Jesus answered, You know neither me nor my father. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. These words Jesus spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no one laid hands on him, for his hour had not yet come. Then Jesus said to them again, I am going away, and you will seek me, and you will die in your sin. Where I go, you cannot come. So the Jews said, Will he kill himself, because he says, Where I go, you cannot come? And he said to them, You are from beneath. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Then they said to him, Who are you? And Jesus said to them, Just what I have been saying to you from the beginning. I have many things to say and to judge concerning you, but he who sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I heard from him. They did not understand that he spoke to them of the Father. Then Jesus said to them, When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself. But as my Father taught me, I speak these things. And he who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I always do those things that please him. As he spoke these words, many believed in him. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants, and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? Jesus answered them, most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin, and a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak what I have seen with my father and you do what you have seen with your father. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You do the deeds of your father. Then they said to him, we were not born of fornication. We have one father, God, Jesus said to them. If God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God. Nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. You are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources for he is a liar and the father of it. But because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Which of you convicts me of sin? And if I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? 
He who is of God hears God's words. Therefore you do not hear, because you are not of God. Then the Jews answered and said to him, Do we not say rightly that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. And I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks and judges. Most assuredly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. Then the Jews said to him, Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham is dead. And the prophets. And you say, If anyone keeps my word, he shall never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham, who is dead? And the prophets are dead? Who do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father who honors me, of whom you say that he is your God. Yet you have not known him, but I know him. And if I say I do not know him, I shall be a liar like you. But I do know him and keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then the Jews said to him, You're not yet fifty years old, and you have seen Abraham. Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Then they took up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. You see, that last little bit, I mean, even as you're reading through it, you can, you can tell that the, the scene never really changes, right? And, and, and you're, as you're told in the beginning part of it, he did this in the temple uh, by the treasury, which as we studied last week is in the court of the women. And then at the end of this, you're told then he departed from the temple. So all this happened right in there, right? So it's, it's, you, you see what the kind of the dilemma is from sort of a, a study standpoint, and it's not a, not a dilemma, it's just that, you know, uh, you, you, you want to, like, keep the continuity of the, the conflict that's going back and forth, and yet, if you just kind of blow through it, then you probably overlook a lot of things. You know, the Bible and the, these gospel narratives, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, but the whole Bible, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't, even though it is a narrative, it's not like a novel, Right? You, you have to read and, and carefully study what these things say because it's not just you know, telling a story like a good novel that gets turned into a screenplay and gets turned into a movie. You know, if you've ever watched one of the cinematic portrayals of the Gospel of John, you know that it's, it's not they're long and it's not easy to follow it all through. Just it doesn't, it doesn't work like that because there's so much of it. I mean, it does. It's not bad, but... but it, 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 it has a lot of stuff that you want to stop and really delve into, right? So, okay, go back to the beginning of this now. And now with the rest of our time here tonight, and I just want to take a quick peek at the time because it does take a while to read that. Okay, so we still have plenty of time to get down to some good study here. Uh, go back to verse 12 and let's just kind of review again. Well, really verse 13. The Pharisees' response to, to Jesus making that great proclamation that just kicked all of this off. The Pharisees' response is what? You bear witness of yourself, your witness is not true. What kind of a response is that? That's a lawyer's response, right? I mean, basically, basically they turned it into a legal issue. Jesus is making a spiritual statement, and the religious leaders turned it into a legal issue. What did they know? They knew that the law couple of times in Deuteronomy, one in chapter 17 and one in chapter 19, uh, they knew, said that um, matters were established not with just one person, but with two or three witnesses. By two or three witnesses, a matter will be established. And, you know, so that was, if you look at those couple of passages in Deuteronomy, they, they relate specifically, at least the one in chapter 17 does in Deuteronomy, uh, to capital offenses, you know, things that are like worthy of death. But as as time went on, and as the uh, as as the rabbinic traditions developed, 
it became a principle that was just applied universally, you know, to to everything. And not and not bad. It's not it's not necessarily wrong to do that, but it kind of became an axiomatic thing. You can't just you can't just make a claim by yourself, right? You you can't make you can't just say something like this and expect everyone to buy into it without you know without without witnesses, right? So so for them, instantly when Jesus said that, it was like their response is you know your testimony is not true because you're speaking about yourself. Um, you bear witness of yourself. Your witness is not true. Now there is no doubt in my mind that the Pharisees understood the claim that he was making in verse 12. Because as we mentioned last week, the context, the history associated with the Feast of Tabernacles, again, not going to take the time to go over all of it now, but clearly a religious mind, which the Pharisees clearly had, would have understood that Jesus, by saying that, was making a self-claim that he was the Messiah, right? Uh, and so um, that's one of the reasons why they jump on this right away, and they they refute it by making it a legal issue. Notice they don't notice they don't specifically challenge the content of the messianic claim, but they just make sort of a a religious technicality out of it. So that's that's the first of what are many objections that you see uh, the Jews making to Jesus throughout this passage. And so for tonight, now we're going to take a look at Jesus' response to this first objection of theirs. And that's what we'll do over the next series of weeks is just kind of take them in in small bites so we can really get the depth of what it is that Jesus is saying. Because what happens is, even just in this first part of this passage, as you go through uh, as you go through verse 19, in verse 20, uh, what happens is it, be t- it turns basically into a gospel presentation. It turns into a gospel presentation not telling all of the details of the gospel or telling someone how to get saved like we would, but it becomes a gospel presentation in that what Jesus ends up arriving at in verse 19 is very similar to what he says in John 14, 6. Nobody comes to the Father except through me, Right? There is, a, there is a great statement made here about the exclusivity of Jesus Christ. Nobody is a child of God. Nobody is saved. Nobody is in the family of God unless they come through that door. Jesus is the only way. And you know what Jesus arrives at is, you don't know the Father, you don't know me. Right? If you knew me, you'd know the Father. Right? And so, it, and, and that's, that's an important point to make right in the beginning because we don't want to lose touch with the fact that the Gospel of John is the Gospel of John. Right? The Gospel of John is written so that, as chapter 20 says, as we've quoted many times before this, that the reader might believe that Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Messiah. And that believing, you might have life in his name. Right? And so it's no surprise that as John wrote this down, it arrived at a point like this. So let's look at Jesus' response. So basically there's, there's a few different ways you can approach this. I, I tried to break it down uh, to like individual points of response because he says a few things here. And I think basically there are three main points to how Jesus responds to all this. So look first at verse 14. Verse 14, Jesus answered and said, Even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true. For I know where I came from and where I am going, but you do not know where I come from and where I am going. So Jesus' response response is, first of all, uh, if if I do bear witness of myself, my witness is true. And what is the basis for which he makes that claim? He makes a comparison between himself and them, right? And it's an important distinction, important comparison that he makes because, it again, it's Jesus revealing himself in these incredibly powerful ways. He says he compares himself as being someone who knows, who knows something with them, people who are ignorant, 
So there's a comparison here made between knowledge and ignorance in a very specific way, by the way. Uh, he says, my witness is true for I know where I came from and where I'm going. Jesus knew where he came from. He knew his origin and he knew where he was going, which was back to where he came from, right? They didn't know that. And so as a result, they were ignorant completely of who he was because start with the very basic thing. Where are you from? They even end up asking him that at one point in all this. Where are you from? Right? They, even though he's been saying it all along. Right? So where Jesus is from defines who he is. That's an important thing to know. Right? They don't know who he is because they don't know where he's from. How did the Gospel of John start? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. That's where Jesus is from. He's from God. So this very narrative itself starts by telling us, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Right? So... Praise the Lord. That's where, right, the Gospel of John started by telling us where Jesus is from, right? Jesus came to earth, right? And uh, later on in chapter 17, and I love, by the way, when you study the Gospel of John, when you want to elaborate on certain points, you find yourself going to a lot of places in the Gospel of John, right? Because, as I mentioned last week, the Gospel of John is this wonderfully encapsulated, self-contained uh, treasure of, of knowledge concerning Jesus. And many of the things, like we just exemplified, uh, many of the things that Jesus says, like, I know where I'm from, well, we read that, right, in the beginning of the book already. It was with God, right? So uh, what when Jesus prays that famous prayer shortly before his crucifixion, the, the, his, his intercessory priestly prayer in John chapter 17, in verses 4 and 5, when he's praying to his father, he says, I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Isn't that great? So right there, Jesus, even in praying to his Father in that moment, is longing for what? He's praying and he's longing for, uh, for the glorification that comes with him being back with his father from where he came. And of course, you know that that's the account, right? Is that Jesus died for our sins, was buried and rose from the dead. And then what? He ascended back to heaven and sat down at the right hand of the father. And when we go through the book of Revelation, we have that scene that should be very well known to you now. God the Father on his throne with the scroll in his hand. John is weeping because nobody's worthy. But then right there, seated on the throne next to him, is the Lamb. The Lamb who has prevailed. And by the way, that terminology, Jesus the Lamb, comes from the Gospel of John. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, right? And it's the Lamb who is seated there at the throne of God at the right hand of the Father who is able, who's worthy to take the scroll and to loose its seal, right? So Jesus came from heaven. They didn't know that. They didn't know that. Now, um, you could say a couple of other things about it. Uh, you could possibly make the claim, I don't want to make it like a legal thing, and I don't have that kind of mind anyway, but it is kind of, like I said, a sort of a sketchy application of the law because when they're making that uh, claim about Deuteronomy 17 and Deuteronomy 19, like I said, those dealt with capital offenses. This isn't really what that is. This is just kind of taking the principle and applying it to, to, uh, to Jesus here. Um, and what Jesus is saying. And, um, and then, of course, though, is just this whole idea that they're ignorant of the truth. And so much about the confrontation that we read through, and we won't get to the details of it tonight, but so much of it is about the truth, right? What's one of the most famous verses in this chapter is that you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free, right? These, these people are not free, because they don't know the truth and they haven't believed the truth. And the reason they don't know the truth is because they're rejecting the one who says, I am the truth, right? The way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, which is also in the Gospel of John, right? So now, so point number one, point number one is that Jesus 
knows who he is, knows where he's from. They don't know who he is. They don't know where he's from. He knows where he's going. They don't know where he's going. And as a result, that's why Jesus says, if I testify of myself, if I witness, bear witness of myself, what my witness is true, right? So the, uh, the law, this, the law that they're quoting in Deuteronomy, the law is given by God. They, of course, reject Jesus, and so they don't know God, and they certainly don't know that Jesus is God in the flesh, but the law isn't written for God. The law is written for man, right? Men need witnesses to corroborate and confirm what is true. God doesn't need witnesses to corroborate what is true because he's God. God speaks, and what God speaks is true because he's God. God defines truth by opening his mouth. You understand? Right? So they don't, they don't quite grasp that, obviously, and they, and they would reject that. If you read, I'll just read it really quick. In, uh, in Galatians chapter 3, um, you can just write this down, look at it later if you want. But Galatians 3.22 says that the scripture has confined all under sin that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. And it goes on to say, therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. So the purpose of the law, Deuteronomy and everything else, the purpose of the law was to convict sinners of their sin. And of course, Jesus is sinless God in the flesh. So Jesus was one person who you could count on that if he opens his mouth and speaks, it's the truth, right? All right. So, uh, so that's point number one. Jesus knew himself. He knew where he was from. He knew where he was going. They did not. So his defense then, based on that, is if he does bear witness of himself, his witness is true. Okay? Then, point number two takes off on this ignorance of theirs. They're, 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 they're ignorant of where, who he is, where he's from, and where he's going, and yet, what are they doing? And this is, this is a common problem in today's world. There's such, a, there's, such a, uh, uh, there's such a profound insight into humanity and the wickedness, the depravity of humanity here. They don't know who he is, where he's from, where he's going, and yet what are they doing? They're judging him. They're judging him. They're judging Jesus as being a false witness, a self-witness, a lawbreaker and a liar, though they know nothing. They're judging entirely according to the flesh. They're judging entirely based on outward appearances. They just flat out don't like Jesus. They're jealous of Jesus. They're threatened by Jesus. They don't believe Jesus. They see that the people are starting to believe and come around maybe to follow him and they're attracted to him and they don't like it, you know? And so they judge him. They just, you know, he makes this claim about being a light, the light of the world and whew, they have no response. Did you notice that? They said nothing about the claim itself, that if people follow him, they won't walk in darkness anymore. They, the, the, the actual content of what he says gets no response. Just the fact that he made it gets a response, right? What, they're, they're, they're judging based on ignorance, right? They're not even like trying to figure out, learn what it is that he's trying to say, which if they did, might soften their hearts and open their minds and bring them to salvation, but they're rejecting that, right? So, Point number two is Jesus, Jesus rebukes them for their carnal judgment. Verse 15, you judge according to the flesh, right? That, what does that mean? You judge according to the flesh. Their judgment was rooted in their ignorance. Their judgment was rooted in the limitations of their fallen, depraved humanness. So their judgment was false because their judgment was rooted in that. Uh, and by the way, on the subject of the two things to elaborate on here, number one is the subject of judgment itself, is judgment itself. Jesus says here, in, as following up to that, what? I judge no one, right? Remember, again, here we go, the self-contained gospel of John. It's magnificent. You go back to chapter three, and uh, the most famous verse in the Bible, I guess, is John 3.16. What's John 3.17, right? 
John 3, 17, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Jesus didn't come to judge and condemn. Jesus came to bring salvation. There will come the time when Jesus is the judge of the, of the heavens and the earth. That's coming, but that's not why he was there now. Jesus didn't come at that time to bring any judgment. Jesus came to bring salvation, right? Praise the Lord. Right? I judge no one. So you see the contrast that he makes. You're judging in your ignorance. You're judging in your carnality. You're judging me and you don't even know where I'm from or where I'm going, right? And I'm not judging anybody, right? Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost, right? Now, so, so there was the one point there that I made about the fact that Jesus didn't come to judge, but the second point that you want to make here uh, before we move on in the text a little bit is about their ignorance. Because you might, you might be inclined to say, Okay, well, they didn't know Jesus. Why didn't Jesus just clearly tell them who he was? Well, number one, he did. And number two, uh, creation does that. Isn't that the point? Hey, this is a nice little segue from our Tuesday night study in Romans. We're right up to verse 18, right? So in that passage, that famous passage in Romans, what does it say in Romans chapter 1? The Apostle Paul writes starting in verse 20 and says, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Creation understands creator, even the invisible attributes of the creator, right? God's invisible attributes. What invisible attributes? His eternal power and his Godhead, right? So in other words, the eternal power of God and the fact that he is God, just that he's there and he's sovereign and he's powerful and he is God. All of that is clearly understood by creation because God has made it evidently, perfectly clear so that they are what? Without excuse. That's what Paul says in Romans chapter 1. Because although they knew God, which is not ignorance, right? In other words, when they weren't ignorant... They didn't glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened, which is the darkening of the foolish hearts is the picture of ignorance. So they went from having knowledge to being ignorant because of the hardness of their hearts. And as a result, the conclusion is ignorance is never an excuse. The fact that these guys were ignorant of who Jesus was and where he was from and where he was going is no excuse for what they're doing. And Jesus makes that very clear, right? All right, and then the third point comes in verse 16. In verse 16 and to the end. So now, now what do we get? Jesus says, and yet if I do judge. So now, now he goes like hypothetical. He says, I judge no one, right? So you're judging me in your ignorance. You're wrong. I'm not judging anybody. But then he goes, what? Oh, and by the way, even if I do judge, right? Even if I do, yet if I do judge, my judgment is true. For I am not alone. So, so that goes back to the beginning of the passage, right? Where, where they said, you're uh, bearing witness of yourself. So Jesus first he kind of grants, yeah, I am bearing witness of myself, but I can because I know who I am and I know where I'm from and I know where I'm going. But then he kind of goes hypothetical on them here and says, by the way, just, just so you know, I'm, I'm not actually here alone. I'm not bearing witness of myself. What does he say? Uh, my judgment is true. I am not alone, but I am with the Father who sent me, Right? Now, we know, reading this, that he's talking about God, his Father. The, the, their, their minds are so darkened that these erudite religious people, they totally understood what he said when he said, I'm the light of the world. They, at, at the moment, in the context of the moment that he said it, they understood that he was claiming to be the Messiah. When he says here that the Father, refers to the Father who sent me, they don't realize at that moment that he's talking about God yet. They're going to come around to it, but we're told in verse 27, they did not understand that he spoke to them of the Father, right? So that's why their question in verse 19 is, where is your Father? 
because they're not thinking they're not thinking in that moment that he's talking about God. Why? Because their foolish hearts have been darkened. And at one point in this dialogue, Jesus even says, "Why don't you understand what I say?" In in a moment of what seems like a, a, like a raw exasperation, it really it really is something, right? So, but anyway, um, the third point then here is that Jesus is not alone. He's not alone in this, right? He says he says even if I am, my witness is true, but actually, I'm not. A, a, a witness who's alone. My father is with me. There are two of us. There's me and there's my father. I am with the father who sent me. And he elaborates in verse 17. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. Right? Well, guess who the two men are that he's like referring to analogously here? Himself and his father. Right? I am one who bears witness of myself. That's one. And the Father who sent me bears witness of me. Right? Now, they're going to really lose it when they come to realize that he's talking about God. Right? But they don't quite yet. So they ask in verse 19, where is your Father? Right? Now, before I move on to Jesus' answer, I just want to remind you of something that we went over before because this, this whole idea of Jesus being a self-witness versus having other corroborating witnesses. We've seen this before, haven't we? And guess where we've seen it? Before in the Gospel of John. <laughs> I say the Gospel of John is like a is like a Jesus library all by itself, you know? I mean it's it's, it's amazing. I mean it's the things that he says, they're amazing. Go back to chapter 5. You remember this? There was another feast in Jerusalem. We were never told what that feast was, but back in chapter 5, this is when Jesus did the healing on the Sabbath. Remember that? And then that this was the point where the 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 real push to have Jesus killed started because he did a miracle on the Sabbath, which they didn't like, and then he defended it by saying, My father is always working and I'm always working. That they understood then that he was making God his father in that moment. And uh that's when they decided they wanted to kill him. And then he makes this great defense of himself there. And uh, let's, just, let's just be reminded of some of this. Uh, well, let's start just for time's sake. I was going to go back a little farther, but let's just go right to verse 31 where he gets right into this. He says, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. Well, wait a minute. Pastor Lou, I thought you just said that, I thought you just said that Jesus said over there in chapter 8, even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true. Is Jesus contradicting himself? No. I believe that in verse... No, of course he's not. I believe in verse 31 what he's doing is he's being hypothetical. He's acknowledging what he anticipates their objection to be so he can make the case that there are other things that testify of the reality of who he is. Thus, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. In your mind in parentheses, you can add... So you say, right? Of course, Jesus is God. You understand that, right? Jesus being God, if Jesus speaks, it's true, right? So if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true, okay? Well, there's another who bears witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. That's a reference to his father, all right? Then he says, you have sent to John, that's a reference to John the Baptist. And he has borne witness to the truth. Uh, then when you get to verse 36, he says, I have a greater witness than John's, the works which the Father has given me to finish. So there's another witness, the works that he did. Verse 37, he reiterates, the Father himself who sent me has testified of me. And then maybe most powerfully at the end, he says, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. So Jesus makes the case there that John the Baptist, the works that he did, the Father himself, the scriptures, these are all witnesses to who Jesus is, right? So this idea that Jesus was just some guy that came into the world and just spoke of himself is not true. Though if he, though if he did, he would have been perfectly true in doing it, okay? Now, go back to uh, chapter 8, and let's, let's, let's wrap this up. Where is your father? That's where we left off, right? 
So you follow this so far? Jesus' first defense to this accusation of being a self-witness was, I know who I am, I know where I'm from, I know where I'm going, you don't, right? So Jesus knew himself, and he was God. He was not subject to the law like sinful men are. Or he was not a corrupter of the law. The law was not there to keep Jesus in check. Jesus was the lawgiver, right? Defense number two was that your judgment is basically rooted in ignorance, right? You're, you judge according to the flesh. You're judging with human limitation. You're judging with your own depravity, corrupting it. I'm not here to judge anybody, and you're judging corruptly. And then defense number three was, oh, by the way, if I do judge and I do speak of myself, I actually do have someone else who is a witness. That's my father. And that's what leads to the question of verse 9. Where's your father? And Jesus answers like this. And, and, and his answer doesn't clear up the fact necessarily that he's talking about God yet. It does later in the discussion, which is why I wanted to read the whole thing, right? I mean, ultimately, this builds to, you know, Jesus saying before Abraham was, I am. So he claims the title, the name of God from Sinai, uh, uh, from, from when God appeared uh, Moses in the burning bush, right? So, uh, but it says here, you know neither me nor my father. Here comes, the, here comes the essential gospel element of this. You know neither me nor my father. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, right? If you get nothing out of this Bible study, and I hope you have already, I have, I hope you have, but if you get nothing else out of it, get this. You go home tonight, and you pray, and you get alone with the Lord, and you pray, you get up tomorrow morning, and you pray, you thank God that he has opened your understanding to who Jesus is, because you don't know anything about God if you don't know Jesus, trust Jesus, have Jesus. I mean, that's it. And there are people all over the world who think they know God and they have vast opinions about God. They have all sorts of sweeping things that they hold onto and embrace and fight for that have to do with their opinions about God. And they have, my God would do this and my God does that. And, oh, I have a great relationship with my God. Everybody like has their own personal God, right? You don't know anything about the one true living God unless you know Jesus Christ as Son. And that, that's your essential gospel moment here, isn't it, right? This is the gospel of John. There it is, right there. You want to know God? You don't know God unless you know Jesus' his son. And Jesus makes that powerfully clear right there. Without even yet fully revealing what he means by my father yet. If you know me, you know my father. But you don't know me, so you don't know my father. May I just close by asking... I mean, I won't take it, and I know almost everybody in the room here tonight, I don't know who's watching online, who's watching this, but do you know Jesus Christ? Do you know him? You are, I say this in love, I say it with an urgency because nothing is more important. I say it with an intensity because I want you to grasp the gravity of it. But if you don't know Jesus Christ, you are completely apart from God, irrespective of what you think you may love. There isn't salvation in anybody else. We are all sinful. That very law that they were supposedly trying to impose on Jesus, that very law defines what is righteous and what is wicked before God. It defines sin. And that law holds all of humanity, including you, under sin and subject to the consequences of sin, which is death physically and death eternally spiritually in hell forever, the lake of fire separated from God because of sin. That's what we deserve. Now, you say you know God, but you don't think that's true? You don't know God because that's the truth of God's word. The only way, and praise God, praise God, the only way to escape that happens to be rooted in God's love. And that is that he sent this Jesus who, you know, he sees what's coming. You know, he says, it. you want to kill me? You're going to kill me. You know, he knows what his destiny is. He knows what his mission is. 
When Jesus ultimately is crucified, he is taking in his death the righteous justice and wrath, the penalties, the penalty of God against our sin. What the law prescribes, what God's law that he gave to Moses prescribes for sin is death, nothing else. Death eternally, separated from God forever. When Jesus died on the cross, his death satisfied the righteousness of God in punishing sin. And now, if you know him, if you receive him, how does the gospel, again, the gospel of John, amazing, right? How does the gospel of John start off again in chapter 1? As many as received him, that's Jesus, to them he gave the power to become the children of God, to those who believe in his name. Is everyone a child of God? Nope. Everyone's a creation of God. Not everyone is a child of God. You become a child of God when you receive Jesus Christ by faith. He died for your sins. He rose from the dead. If you will humble yourself and repent, turn from your sins and turn to Jesus in faith and cry out to him, like he said in the Gospel of John, to the woman at the well, right? If you knew who it was who was asking you for a drink, you'd ask him and he'd give you living water. You need to go to Jesus and ask him for that gift of life. Recognize your sinfulness. Humble yourself. Turn from your sin. Grieve over your sin. Turn to Jesus and cry out to him, Lord, I believe on you. I believe you are the son of your father who is God. And I believe you died for my sins and you rose from the dead. And cry out to him and ask him for that gift of salvation. Then you will come to know God. Then God will be your father, as God is Jesus' father. Another thing the Gospel of John says, after Jesus rises from the dead, when he appears to Mary Magdalene, he says, Go tell my brethren that I am going to my God and their God, to my father and to their father. Right? If you come to know Jesus, his father becomes your father. The, 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 the stark difference between one destiny and the other couldn't be farther apart. And these guys were far away, man, because they didn't know him. They thought they knew God, but they rejected Jesus. Nope. Come to Jesus. That, that's why Jesus responds. You know, they're judging him. You know, my witness is not true. My witness is not true. I know where I'm from. I know where I'm going. You don't. You're, you're judging according to the flesh here. I don't even judge anybody. But even if I did judge someone, I know it's true because I'm not alone. My father is with me. Right? And so, where is your father? Well, you don't know him because you don't know me. You get it? You get it? That's just, you see why we have to break this down slowly? I mean, that's a, that's what a tremendous gospel moment that is. Know Jesus, K-N-O-W, Jesus, and have the eternal salvation of the Father. All right, we'll press forward on this next week a little bit more, okay? Let's close with prayer, everybody. Our Father in heaven, thank you for your word and its tremendous power. We thank you that you open our understanding to receive it. I pray that everybody listening to this would have a rock-solid, unswerving, true, saving faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, and that only comes when you draw people to yourself, as the Gospel of John says. Please, Lord, draw people to yourself that they might repent and believe and receive your salvation. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.